Welcome to the AMATIC 2018 webinar series. Today we've got Transitional Math, the Next Frontier in Developmental Math Pathways with Kathleen Almy. Sponsoring committees are Mathematics for Liberal Arts and the Developmental Math Committee. My name is Julie Gunkelman. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for AMATIC and I will be your host today. Please note that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Commercial products mentioned by the presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. Our uh, webinar series is sponsored by McGraw-Hill this year. Thank you very much, McGraw-Hill. I'd like to read just a few things about um, Kathleen to you. Um, Kathleen Almy is a mathematics research associate for Northern Illinois University Center for P20 Engagement, as well as the director for Transitional Math. She leads projects for state agencies related to transitional and developmental math initiatives. Prior to joining the P20 Center, she was a mathematics professor, professor with 20 years of experience in high school and college classrooms. Her degrees include a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics Education from Southern Illinois University and a, master, a Master's uh, in Pure Mathematics from Northern Illinois University. Kathleen is pursuing a doctorate in higher education with an emphasis on community college leadership. Thank you, Kathleen. I'd like to turn it over to you now. Okay, so I take it we need to go ahead and share screen. All right, so let's see if we can get all this to roll. <laughs> okay, so Julie, do we have it correct now or do we need yep. to swap it yet? You've got it correct now. Oh, awesome. Okay, and um, you can hear me all right? Yep. Okay. So hi everyone. Um, some of you, I, I recognize some names um, in the, uh, the attendees list and some are new. Um, hopefully I'll be giving you lots of inter interesting information um, this nice Wednesday. So um, Julie introduced me, I'm Kathy Almy. Um, some of you have known me as uh, math faculty. That was my position for a long time, but in the last year and a half, I've made some big transitions myself. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about those and then move into what this whole topic is and why um, at community colleges it, it matters um, and should be something of interest to everyone. So, um, oh, first off, and I am also, I want to make sure you know where I'm at. Um, I'm in uh, Northern Illinois, about an hour and a half northwest of Chicago, um, actually in Rockford. In my house today, and it's dreary and humid, so yay. Okay, so um, there I am. So you know, my webcam, I, as Julie said, is not operating, but at least you can get a sense of what I looked like on one day that I liked my hair. Okay, so um, we know these things. The main thing is I've worked, and some of you I've worked with on this, but I've worked on reform um, locally, and then I worked statewide and nationally back and forth with different efforts for years. And the pathways initiatives were the ones I was most interested in. So um, things like data centers, um, I don't think it's new Mathways project anymore, it's their Mathways project, but um, I worked a little bit with them, worked a little bit with the Carnegie Center and a lot with a man, uh, or Carnegie Foundation and worked a lot with the Maddox um, New Life for Developmental Math. And so the math literacy course, um, there's courses that are similar to it like Quantway and then Dana Center's Foundations course, but they were developmental pathways courses that were offered for students that were headed towards non-STEM pathways and we were trying to give them a different experience. And I absolutely, fully, still totally believe in that method, although my, and that's one of the things you'll see as we talk about today, some of the things I believed um, have evolved over time, um, definitely informed by research, but um, I'm still, I'm still committed to the idea of doing whatever we can to serve students who need remediation and whenever possible using contextualization and ways to motivate them because anyone who's taught this way knows it's motivating, it's effective, it helps students connect with content, and it's not the same old, same old, which is something we need, especially for students that aren't particularly motivated or engaged um, with the math that we want them to be. So in the last year, um, we had a lot of issues at my college, and to give you an idea of how many issues we have, we've had over, um, we've lost over 30 full-time tenured math faculty at my community college I was at for a very long time um, and I've read lots of things on you know on, on volatility at colleges and they say the way you know that a college is really struggling is if you lose your tenure faculty and we had we basically had a mass exodus and I was uh, a part of that and it started with rifts reduction in force but then there was a lot of people that just like myself um, just like you know I think I want to do something different and, and maybe potentially a more stable environment um, so what I work for now is and I use P20 Center Northern Illinois University 
And it's a center that is dealt with, that deals with outreach. It works primarily in Illinois, but it also works with some other states on projects. We have new, a new law, so I'll be talking about that. And basically my role is I'm hired to help scale up these different initiatives that the state is working on. And because I'm crazy, I'm working on my doctorate. Um, but one thing that's nice um, in it is that when any, any time I get a chance to choose a topic, I choose anything I can that has to do with developmental education and placement. And I read a lot. I've always read a lot of research, but now I read a lot of research. Um, just this summer, I read like 40 articles on um, placement and dev ed. And a lot of the things that I felt for a very long time have changed. I used to be like most faculty members that the, the placement exam is accurate. And if it says a student should be taking a developmental course, they should be. And what a lot of research has found is that placement tests aren't as accurate as we thought they were. And I think the thing that as a faculty member, my perspective was always, we don't want to put them in a course for which they're not going to be successful. That that is a bad outcome, which I still agree is a bad outcome. But one of the things that the research shows us is there's a lot of other bad outcomes that can happen when a student is in developmental education. They can end up not ever getting to college level maths. And we all know this, that you know, we often, if you're just focusing on a pass rate of a course that doesn't get the whole perspective, that we, we look at how much, how often do they get to college level? How often do they complete? When they start in dev ed, their, percentage, their chances of that are much lower um, for a whole variety of reasons. But then there's also cost to the student in terms of time and money, but also sometimes their self-esteem. Students feel like they've been labeled as lesser than. And so with all of that, and the fact that developmental education nationally costs the US $7 billion, um, one of the things that I, the main thing I've taken away is, yes, we're always going to need dev ed, but we need to make sure a student really needs it. And if a student does not need it, it could possibly benefit from some other intervention, then we should strive to do that because there are, there are some really negative consequences that can happen sometimes to students in dev ed, and the data is compelling enough to make us, you know, need to consider that. So, in all of that, let's talk about what transitional, or sometimes they're referred to as transitions courses are. In Illinois, we call them transitional, but if you start to look this up, you'll see both names, both words used. So, what I'm talking about are courses or content. They can be standalone courses, but sometimes it's content in different ways online or embedded in other courses that are offered to high school seniors who are at risk for being placed into developmental education. And you can do it in math, reading, and writing. Illinois, I lead the, the math efforts, but my role will morph into working on English language arts with the help of content specialists from those areas um, at some point. Now, we don't, I don't know if it's the near future or the far future, but I know Illinois is headed towards that. And the idea is not just that a student takes a course at the high school level. The idea is that there's some agreement often between the high school and the college that deals with the high school student's placement. Now, sometimes they can get direct placement into a college course. Sometimes there's an agreement that a student will take a particular test. Maybe it's a final exam. Maybe it's still a placement test. There's usually some agreement with the course that has to do with placement. It's not just necessarily a fourth year of math. There's more to it than that. So let's start with our first poll question. Um, and Julia will bring that up. What I want to know is, is your college, so let's just start at the college level. Is your college working in partnership with any of your area high schools on any kind of courses or acceptance and placement? So it looks like just about everybody has um, put their response in there. You're looking at about 68% yes. Oh, interesting. That's awesome. Oh, I forgot to share it. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> even go. prettier. So definitely, that's, that's something, you know, I want to learn from you as much as I'm giving you information. Um, we will have some different places where, you know, you can do the chat and the Q&A and um, we'll have time for questions. But, you know, there's things that you have to share that are working or things that are not that's I worked in reform long enough to know you can look at failures and learn just as much as you can from successes. Um, the second thing I'd like to know is, I can get the whole question, my own slides to move, there we go. Is your state working on transitional courses?
So it looks like about 47% said yes and 53% said no. That's really interesting. And that actually, I'm gonna show you some um, information from the Community College Research Center in just a minute. And that it seems to echo what they have found as well. So maybe our sample here is representative. Lovely, always like that. Um, and then if you are in a state where your state is working on it, can, can we do the final poll? Can you, um, or maybe, no, we're gonna use, I think the Q and A or chat, if you can type it in, what state you're in. Yeah, just go ahead and put that in the chat window. So Ohio, Texas, Northeast Texas. Come on, there's more of you than that. North Carolina, Texas again. So in Q and A, we have New York. Oh, someone in Q&A had some, okay, perfect. Yep. I'll clear that. Is that it? I'll take a new one again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay, that just gives me a sense of, oh, it's South Pennsylvania. Yep. Awesome. All right, so let's start looking at this just first off nationally, transitional courses. So CCRC did a nationwide scan um, last over the course of last year and in, in illinois i was interviewed uh for that um illinois is one um, every state is interviewed in some shape or form or investigated um i assume they did interviews with the vast majority if not all um and what they found was that transitional courses are offered in 39 states i mean that's significant um and that's up from 29 states just in 2012 I, they did a scan then as well so i thought that was really interesting that there's been growth in that um, what they found was they are usually done at the local level instead of statewide, which is exactly what our poll showed, which I thought was interesting, as someone who taught stats for years. Um, but what there's also what they're finding is, is that a lot of states are changing over from a focus to from local to statewide implementations. And that's exactly what happened in Illinois. Um, Illinois is not known for state mandates when it comes to education. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But um, it's pretty much people were, you know, a lot of people were doing this and like, oh, this is a really neat thing. But there wasn't any state mandate that you had to do it. Um, but as most things, if we wait for everyone to get on board with something that's effective, we'll be waiting a long time. Um, because there's always going to be some people that, for whatever reason, don't necessarily want to um, make a change. There's a variety of reasons that's true. Um, so this is the source of it. You will be getting the slides. I'll be sending those to Julie and she'll be making those available. If you just are like dying to see the report where I got this from, all you have to do is a Google search for CCRC transitions courses and it will bring up their research brief that they did. Um, and it's, it's a really nice, they, they just in general do, I think really fantastic work. Um, but this is one of the things directly from it, which I thought was interesting that I think you might be interested in. So you can find your state. I'll leave it up for a minute so you can find it. But you can see, you know, this is what they found, that there were a lot of states that are, that are doing some kind of implementation, more local than statewide, um, but that they're finding that has definitely changed from when they did this uh, several years ago. So, um, and you see lots of math and English. So, although I'm always told that you're the problem child with math, definitely it looks like English is something people are working on too, which is great. All right, let's move on. Okay, so one of the things that I'm a big believer in is there, there are no magic bullets. And I get really suspect when anybody says there are, because anybody who's worked in developmental education, which I'm guessing, because a lot of you I recognize names, I know you have for as long as I have and some of you much longer. You know that learning and students are as a complex entity altogether. And there is no one thing that's going to work for everyone to reduce remediation and get students um, effectively to the college level where we need them to be so they can pass a college level math class. So what I love, and when you see TM, that's just, that stands for transitional math. What I love about this is this isn't a fad or anything like that. It's just to me another cog in the machine that we're all trying to work on to reform and make math work better for students who aren't yet, yet at the college level. So transitional math just supports all these efforts that are already happening. And because I, when it started working, when it started happening in Illinois, because we have a mandate and we are scaling and everyone is required to do it. There were faculty who were like, we've been working on co-recs. Are you saying like that's out and this is now the new hot thing? And it's like, no, no, no. 
No, they're just different and they serve different populations. So that's what I want you to see. So you've got, you know, the developmental level and there's, we've all had, you know, developmental courses, the traditional sequence forever, for over 40 years. Um, and then over the last 10 years, pathways courses have come to be, and I mentioned some of those before, the math literacy course, and some of you I know well, that that's the one that I've been working on for years. So um, we've got those courses that are an alternative to the traditional beginning and intermediate algebra. And what and you're in, some of you are in these states, there are states that have said, you either can't have Dev Ed or you can't require students to take Dev Ed, or if we are going to allow you to have Dev Ed, you can only max have one course. And so what some states are doing is like, if you only have one course, they're picking a pathways course because they feel like that's a good, well-rounded course that supports non-STEM students. It can also support STEM-bound students and get them ready for potentially an intermediate algebra class after it. Um, but that's what some um, states are doing. So that's a good option still, pathways courses. CoREC is something that the data is showing has a ton of potential. And CoREC is one that I have really changed my mind on, but I try to be true to what I want, you know, when I work with people, what I want them to do. Let's look at the data, what does it actually say? And it changed my mind on a lot of things. I used to believe that CoRECs were only for students that were very close to placing in a college level. And that just isn't necessarily the case. There's a lot of students that actually can benefit from them. I don't think it's a magic bullet. I don't think everybody can be successful in CoRec. We all know students that come to us and they're basically functioning at the fourth grade level. I don't think you can just put them in a stats class and give them lots of tutoring and the magic's gonna happen. But there are more students than I think a lot of us re recognize or realize. Um, and one of my favorite studies um, that I learned about several months ago, but I think is fantastic, was the, the random um, control trial that was done, I believe it was at CUNY, the City University of New York, where they had about 250 students that they randomly placed, they, they had all placed into beginning algebra, that level. And what they did was they randomly assigned them into beginning algebra, beginning algebra with support, or elementary st uh, statistics with support. And of the three groups, the highest pass rates were the stats class at the college level. That was very compelling to me. I'm not saying that that's you know, magic and everything, but there was a you know, significant number of students there that passed a class, and in my mind, I was like, if they place the beginning algebra level, there's no way that they could pass the stats class, and that's not necessarily the case. So what um, some states are looking at is, having the default be if it makes sense for students to start in COREX, if, they make, if it makes sense. If that's too much for them, either by placement or a student feels that that's too much, have developmental options, but have fewer of them that they feel are, are higher quality, like pathways courses that they feel are more current and up to date and in line with the goals that schools have now and are working on that college readiness piece in addition to just content. In addition to that, we're going to throw in transitional math, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Transitional courses are, the idea is, let's try to reduce these number of students that come to us straight out of high school. They literally graduate in May, and in August, you're sitting in your developmental class. That's the population we're trying to address with transitional math. I have said this, and I really believe this. Dev Ed is never going to go away. We will always have students that come to colleges that need more support than they can get by just starting in a college level class or um, you know, a co-rec class. Um, but it would be nice if we had fewer of those. And so the idea of transitional math is that reduces those students to possibly the students that don't pass transitional math or ones that are returning adult students. But we can dramatically reduce the rate of that straight out of high school, bam, right into debt. All right, so let's look at Illinois, what we're doing and how it's different. Now, I'm not saying it's always better, but it is different than what a lot of states are doing. And, I mean, there are times where I'm very jealous of how other states are doing their implementation. And there's times where I think that we are doing some things that are worth looking at. That's one of the reasons why I offered to do this webinar, because I think there's some lessons um, that we were learning that I think are valuable. Um, it's not simple, but it has, one of the things that we've really, the way that the law was structured in Illinois and the way the implementation has been created is it's all about creating buy-in from both sides, high school and community college. Because again, we don't have mandates in Illinois. This is a first. And so you've got to have buy-in. Because I know a law is like you have to do it, but we all know people find ways around any kind of requirement. We want people to actually believe in it and really do it for real and this not be something that's a fad and just dies out in a few years. 
So one of the things that we do different in Illinois is we do emphasize the multiple pathways approach. We do not have a one size fits all senior course. We want students to identify a meta major. We'll look at that more in a second. And we have three options for them based on meta majors. That means, you know, that's three times the amount of work, but it, it's, it's not trying to put everyone into a box. Um, we are highly emphasizing contextualized content, truly authentic, just like pathways content um, that's aligned to careers. And this is not just a fourth year of algebra. Um, and that's not lip service, it's legitimate, which makes it a lot harder to develop and do professional development and all of it. But the impact, as we've all seen, anyone that's taught any kind of pathways courses at colleges know it's worth it because it can work. Um, we do not have a statewide curriculum. We do not have a statewide text. Illinois does not operate that way. So, um, you know, it's not just literally like some states, it's like, here's your course, here's your book, go. That I, in some ways, I, would, I wish we had that because it would be simpler, but this way allows people to have flexibility, allows them to have more ownership over their curriculum. Of course, with that comes more variability. And then that makes people nervous as well. Um, are we gonna have consistency? Are we gonna have students that are truly prepared? For college. So one of the big things that governs everything that we do, and I'm not saying other states don't do this, but I'm saying this is like a heavy emphasis in Illinois, is we are all about the partnerships between high schools and community colleges and building trust and relationships, and there's equal oversight between them. Also, we do not have a several million dollar grant from a foundation funding us. I wish we did. We've applied for some. We'll continue to apply for them. Anybody knows me? Grants that are, you know, that are offering grants, we will, uh, foundations that are offering them, we will continue to apply for them. I wish we had that. But the work continues. And the way that we've done that is we've had state groups that have offered funds. We've had some private funders that have offered, and we continue to work with them and piece that together to be able to pay for this at scale. Um, it's not simple. We have to be resourceful, but it's happening. Um, and we'll continue to try to seek, we always are trying to seek more funding but when we do get funding, we try to be very careful how we use it to make our money go as far as possible because we don't have um, that big grant from a um, corporation or a foundation. All right, so Illinois, let's look at the wonder that is my state, which by the way, it sounds like I don't love it, but I do. This is where I was born and raised. I've lived at both ends of it and I love this state, but we have a lot of challenges. Number one, we have over 700 high schools and only three years of math are required to graduate. 48 community colleges, which are organized into 39 community college districts. So like City College of Chicago is seven colleges, but they operate as one district, but it is seven colleges. Um, and then there's four colleges, Illinois Eastern Community Colleges, they operate as a district. We are a local control state. We are all about that at any level that the, the school gets choice and decision-making power, that there's not a board of regents. We don't have a board that, that will say everybody has to do this. There are things that come from our state board of ed for high schools that they have to do, but they still get a ton of local control over what they do. Everyone is unionized throughout our state, high schools and community college levels, and um, a lot of universities are as well. Um, we had a horrible budget stalemate for two years and it broke in June 2017, thankfully. Um, and we had no troubles getting a, a budget this year, which was great. But for two years, um, there was just basically there was hardly any money going to colleges and universities. Um, there was some funds going to K-12, but the colleges and universities were in all senses cut off um, through the stalemate. And that was incredibly difficult. And because of that, um, there, was, there was a lot of impact. There was a lot of rifts, so um, reduction in force throughout the state, not just at my college. Um, we've lost a lot of students. There's just been this mass exit um, from our colleges in terms of people who teach at them and work at them and students who go to school in Illinois. Um, so there's, there's been a lot of effects. Um, we've had all kinds of initiatives to reduce remediation, but nothing's been required or at scale. And so this is the takeaway. You can do it here, you can do it anywhere. So that's, you know, there's going to be things I'm going to talk to you about and you'll be like, well, we don't have to deal with that issue, which is, and what I say to you is great, and that's going to make, if you're interested in doing this, that much easier to do. Um, and I'm envious, but um, I do know that even with all these challenges, we are still getting a lot done, and it, it can, you can make progress and get things moving. And I will, I'll be honest, a law helps. Um, I'm, I'm usually 
all about faculty grassroots led efforts. That's what I've been on the vast majority of, of my time working with reforms, but there are limitations to those in terms of reach and scale. And I have seen that firsthand. And so there are times where I'm just really grateful to have a law because some people will always be obstructionist just to be so. And this allows that to not necessarily occur. Doesn't mean I don't want their buy-in, I do. But I don't want to bring them kicking and screaming with me. But um, having a law does help somewhat. All right, so I'm gonna use some different acronyms and I want you to know what I'm talking about. We've got um, our three levels and each has a governing board, ISB, Illinois um, School Board, Illinois State Board of Education, I should know this, I work with them every day, Illinois Community College Board, and the Illinois Board of Higher Education. So like I said, we don't have a board of regents that's over all of higher ed. You're gonna see these acronyms as well, high school, transitional math, community college, OER, many of you are very familiar with that, are open resources. ESSA is a K-12, initiative, it's basically the new No Child Left Behind, but it's about accountability. Um, and then there's the Illinois Articulation Initiative. I will briefly talk about that later. Okay, so here's where we're at. Nationally, none of this should come as a surprise to you. About half of community college students go into deaf ed. And what happens is, because I get asked this all the time when I'm at meetings, well, why is that? We, you know, high school teachers be like, we've done our job. Someone just said this to me last week, we've done our job. How are they, like, you know, getting into Devet. And what happens in Illinois is they take their senior year off. And then the first thing they do when they come to the college is take a placement test. We all know that. They take a year off, they're not going to do well on a placement test. So that's a lot of times they have met those standards at the end of their junior year, but a year passes and a lot changes. And so that's one of the things that's going against them. Also, we're big on most schools use single places of measure or single placement measures instead of multiple measures. And those have been shown, CRC, CCRC has done studies on this but they do underplace students. Um, sometimes they overplace students, but not that often. Um, they, when, they're mistake, when they're making mistakes, it's by putting students in a low, course lower than what they could pass. Um, so there are students, especially in our state, that avoid a fourth year of math, or they're in a course that doesn't really meet their needs or their goals. Like, say for, they're in a course, like they're headed towards statistics, but they're in another algebra class. It's not really helping them get ready for that the type of work they're going to do in statistics class. Um, in Illinois, we have about 40% of residents have um, a post-secondary college or career credential. We are a 60 by 25 state, so by 2025, the goal is to have 60%. Now, I got these figures from the 60 by 25 website that Illinois has. I believe we're above 40% now um, because that's not a very long time to, you know, to do a lot. We've been making steady increases, but we still have a ways to go. So this is the issue we're looking at. We all know this. Anytime that there's a transition point, that there's potential issues, that students are not quite ready for the expectations that are going to come when they move from one level to another. And what we're looking at is this one when they're going from high school to college. And we all want the same thing, high schools and college. We want students to come to colleges ready for the rigor they're going to expect, get, they're, they're going to see and be successful in it so that they can complete um, and one thing you need to know about me and any of this I'm talking about, I don't want rates that are good on paper, and that's great, but I want it in reality. Um, we're not about reducing standards so that we can have better numbers. We genuinely want more students to be prepared for college courses and be successful in them. Are we going to get them all there? No, we're not. I mean, let's just be real. But we can certainly get more through than we are now. All right, so this is the typical approach that a lot of schools outside of Illinois and inside of Illinois take. They often, I would say developmental ed is the gift that keeps on giving. We got it from high schools and now we're giving it back. A lot of times a, a college will make a reform and the high school will be like, well, that's really cool. We should offer that as a senior course. And so they might offer intermediate algebra. A lot of them like to offer these pathways courses. So we had high schools approaching our college four or five years ago saying, Hey, we heard about that math literacy course you have. We'd like to offer that. And we're like, okay. Um, typically, it's a dual credit approach where it's the same text, the same grading, and normally what comes with that are the same results. That's what, so like when people get really excited, they're like, yeah, we're offering intermediate algebra at our high schools. A lot of times they're seeing the same good and bad that comes with that. Um, so it's not necessarily like when they're offering that course that things are dramatically better at the high schools. Um, but we've seen, you know, um, improvements with our math literacy course, the high schools are seeing that as well. So, you know, the good and the bad is typically seen at both places. Um, 
Placement can be based on, as I said before, a test. Sometimes it's by the grade. It depends on the agreement between the high school and the college. The issue is that most high schools, if they do this, or most, most colleges, if they do this, either way, feel like they're starting from scratch. Um, there's no consistency. In most places, it's not necessarily at scale. And here's an issue. The place that the students get is often not portable. Students do move. And sometimes they, they don't necessarily move, but they go to a community college that's near them, but not necessarily the first one that would be considered their um, feeder community college that their school is supposed to go with. It might be because there's a program they want to go into. Say it's like dental hygiene, and it's only offered at a few community colleges. And there might be an agreement where they're allowed to go to one that's nearby that's not actually their typical partnership community college with their high school. But what I'm getting at is students often need to take their placement with them. And if they go beyond where this high school and college agreement is, sometimes that fourth year is for nothing. And so that we've seen, and that's really discouraging the students. And the cost model has been based on the college approach. The high school typically uses whatever textbook the college is using, and that is just not affordable um, with the way that um, high schools, their cost approach. They're, you know, in, in college, it's not affordable for college students either, but they're individually paying for it. In the high school case, the high school is absorbing all that cost. And when it's consumables, that's particularly expensive. Um, a lot of high schools, they like to use technology, but they're not necessarily one-to-one -one, and they're not necessarily ready to use online homework systems. And so the idea that you can just translate that directly to high school does not always work. That's what they found. And they, they need more flexibility with how they use materials, open materials whenever possible or what they would like. So this is the law that we had in Illinois. I'm giving it to you in case you want to look it up. And like I said, we get the slides later so you can actually get the specific number. It has four components to it that are all about improving readiness for college. So we call it the PWR Act, Post-Secondary and Workforce Readiness Act. The fourth piece is transitional math, and that's the part that I run for the state. So these are fourth year courses that are supposed to smooth this transition to college, but this is not dual credit, it's not AP, it's not dual enrollment, it's not for college credit, these are high school courses offered at high schools by high school teachers. That's the idea, which makes colleges nervous. And I'm just gonna be very frank with you about that. And I wanna show you the things that we've done to ensure quality and to hopefully you know, reduce, I'd love to remove the concerns that faculty have. All right, so this is the approach. This is it in a nutshell, simple but not easy. So the idea is junior year, high schools are gonna determine if their students, so they project them to be ready for college math based on multiple measures. If they are not ready, we're not gonna wait till they start college, we're gonna take care of it their senior year. And they're gonna take this co-developed course, it's been developed between the high school and the college, that has portable placement. We'll talk more about that, what that means in a minute. And then they're going to get college placement as soon as they pass the course. That's the idea in a nutshell of what we're doing. But we're doing it with every high school, except for the ones that opt out by the laws, the law has a provision for that. Um, and every community college. All right, so here's our overview. We have three meta majors. The name STEM is not accurate, and we did ask for that to be changed in the law, but the state agencies did not want to change that. But what I want you to understand is that pathway is for the student who is headed towards college algebra. It might be a STEM path, it might be in elementary education. So it's not necessarily they're headed towards traditional STEM, but that's the name of it in the law. Then there's like the non-STEM path. Those are the students that are headed towards statistics or a quantitative literacy course. And then the students that are headed towards a technical field. We just need students to think broadly, which one do you think you will head towards? The law says if they don't know, the default is QL. The default is not basically Algebra 2. Although that STEM course is not identical to Algebra 2, there's a lot of similarities between it. So the idea is these high school courses if a student gets to see or better, they get guaranteed placement at any Illinois community college. That's what the portability piece means. And they get placement at any four-year university who elects to accept it. Four years in our state are not required, but they can accept it. The placement is determined by a grade. So I know some of these things are gonna, you're gonna be like, well, that's not, that isn't the case in our state. So when you're looking through the information I'm giving you, there are some things here that I think will be nuggets that you could use if you're interested in doing this on a small or a larger scale. Um, even though some of it will be specific to my state, you know, definitely. Um, but 
we're not basing it on a placement test. We're giving basically, and you know, college faculty get very nervous about this, but what I try to remind them, and I would have been nervous too about this. I mean, I'm not saying I wouldn't have been, but these courses are not just any old course done any old way. You'll see that in a minute. There's a lot of rigor expectations and requirements and oversight. Um, but as I remind them, do you give your students Accuplacer at the end of your intermediate algebra class before they go to your stats class? And it's, no, we don't. And so that's what we're doing for these students as well. If they take this course and it's approved at the state level um, to be meeting the requirements it's supposed to be, they get a C or better, they get placement without a placement test. Um, there is flexibility with implementation. Some schools will do, most schools will do these as standalone courses, but some will embed the competencies. We don't have objectives or standards, we have competencies. And the competencies sometimes are embedded into, like say a technical course, like a welding course. And the student um, can do basically, they're already doing a lot of that content anyway, but they'll get math placement while they're doing their, their welding class. And I mentioned the portability. Um, I will give you a link later for where you can get into the nitty gritty if you want to see our state policies, our competencies, all of it. It's um, all available online. Um, the main thing is for that student to be able to get that placement and take it throughout the state, um, their, the course that their high school is offering has to meet the policies and the competencies that have been defined at the state level. Now, all those that were created, policies and competencies, were all made by work groups with college and high school faculty on them, as well as administrators and all other kinds of people. It wasn't just a legislator that said, this is what you're going to do. There was a lot of ownership um, with faculty in terms of crafting how this law would be put into action. And I think that was very smart. So this is our, um, our flow chart. So you can see the different pathways. So we've got the transitional courses on the bottom row and the law requires that every high school has to offer at least one pathway and offer a transitional course um, or they have to opt out. Um, they're not all gonna offer three options because I work with some high schools that have 100 students in the high school. So I mean, it's not even possible. But the goal is to offer at least one of these um, courses. And then you can see above the outcome courses for which they get placement. Um, for example, if you do the transition to college algebra, which is what a lot of schools are calling it, the student gets placement in college algebra, but they also get placement in everything below college algebra. So a stats class, uh, and I'm talking about an elementary uh, stats class that usually has like an intermediate algebra prereq or a beginning algebra prereq, not one that has a college algebra prereq. But they get placement into stats, a gen ed math, quantitative literacy, a tech class, they get a lot of placement. If they do the transition to QL, they get placement into several non-STEM college courses as well as technical math. All of these courses have algebra in them, but the, the amount varies. All of them are highly contextualized. That amount varies too. It's a lot easier to contextualize quantitative literacy concepts and technical concepts. It is hard to contextualize factoring. And if anybody finds a good way to do it, shoot me an email, because that ain't easy to do. So we're trying to, whenever possible, especially for that transition to STEM, have context and make that content meaningful. The thing that we struggle with because I saw actually, um, we have someone from Dana Center that's online. I think Dana Center has done an amazing job in looking at the whole picture. Um, and I'm jealous. And we were just having this conversation the other day. I wish that we had the approach that they're looking at, which is not, they basically looked at this whole intermediate algebra, college algebra, then trig and calculus. And they have reimagined those, reconfigured those, instead of having four courses with tons of overlap and have a smoother transition between, I think it's three courses they've done, and all of them have context and meaning and concepts. And unfortunately, it's hard to reform from below. In our state, we still have intermediate algebra, we still have college algebra. So that transition to STEM is a hard course to create because you want it to be contextualized, but it's not a college algebra course. It's really highly procedural. So how do you make that happen and not make it into a college algebra course? So that's one of the things that we're struggling with, but we're, we're coming up with some solutions. If you have ideas, again, I'm always game. Okay, um, this is what happens their junior year. The counselors and teachers um, have a list of multiple measures based on all kinds of things, and the student has to meet at least two of them. Like I told you, I'll give you the link and you can see the specifics of this. GPA are included if the, if the school uses Alex, if the school uses Accuplacer, um, you know, all different kinds of things, Park. There's all different ways um, and a student has to meet two of them. If they're projected ready, we want them in something rigorous their senior year, um, and then move right into college level. So preferably AP or dual credit their senior year. 
but they're not projected ready, or if they are projected ready, but they're not willing to take that course. But let's say they're projected ready in the next course is pre-calc, but they barely got through algebra two. Um, in all likelihood, they're not gonna be projected ready in that case, but with other measures they might be, but they might not feel comfortable with that. So not projected ready or not willing to take that placement that says that they are, we want them in transitional math. Um, and then when they pass that, they get, with C or better, they get um, placement into a transitional course. Either way, they don't pass that senior course and they're, take, they're, they're a subject to placement at the college level. So placement's not disappearing, but this should reduce the number of students that have to take a placement test. Here's some logistics and then, and I'm gonna try to get, let, answer some of your questions and then just hit some highlights. And what I'll do is there's gonna be other slides that I'm not gonna to get to and the world won't end. I'll just, I wanna hit some highlights and answer some of your questions and then I'll send you, um, or Julie will send the slide deck and there's more information. But, because I hate that these slides are so text dense, but in the benefit is you could probably read some of them later and get the gist that you need to of things I don't get to. So let's find the bright side. Um, some logistics. We are making sure the students have to have met the graduation requirement. This, these courses in our state do not count for the graduation requirement that the state has. Um, placement has an end date, or the law says 18 months in our case. The courses are transcripted on the high school transcript, but they're not on the college transcript because they're not college courses. And schools get to choose, do they want to do it one semester or one year? Um, if you do it one semester as a transitional course, you can bookend their senior year with dual credit. I'm not saying every student can do that, but it is an option. And I've seen some larger suburban schools are going to have multiple um, sections of transitional math, and they're going to have longer ones that are over a year and shorter ones that are over a semester. So there's flexibility in how you do it. Okay, so let's just stop for a second and let's see the Q&A. Um, do we have any questions that people want to ask at this point? I don't see anything in the box yet. All right. I, if we don't, I'll stop if we need to, but otherwise I'll just keep yapping at you. Okay. <laughs> All right. If you have them, post them. Okay, so the big thing is, and this is where I think that all the work that Amatic has done with various foundations on pathways, this is, it's continuing that. We are not going back and making these courses, intermediate algebra, part two. That's not what we're doing. We're gonna make them contextualized, problem solving, lots of college and career readiness. And we had um, an administrator who used to be a math faculty member say this, I love this. We want students focusing on complex problems, not just complex procedures and really get them experiencing math, experiencing what it looks like, showing them how math is used in various careers and make it as authentic as possible. One of the ways that we're doing that is we're interviewing employers and taking information from them and building that into more tasks and projects that will be used in the classroom. Because unfortunately, we, got, we had a, well, unfortunately and unfortunately, um, as math teachers, we did get critiqued as the people that are working on this in the state um, by folks that are outside of math, they said, how can math teachers be expected to make it contextualized and relevant when they don't work in those fields? And so they, you know, because we had a public commenting period and we heard that. So it's really important to us as we're implementing that we get feedback from people in and out of the math classroom to make sure we're serving these students as best as possible. So let me see an example of what this looks like. This is from the technical course, because what happens sometimes is people look at our, our flow chart and they're like, oh, is the tech course the really easy ones for the low students? And it's like, no, that's not the intent at all. All of these courses are rigorous. They're just different and they're aligned to different pathways. So this is for the technical student. Maybe they're headed towards um, a medical field, you know, maybe paramedic or they're going into nursing or something. And what happens is when they get into those classes, they might see a problem like this in like a dosage class. And the teacher will be like, sometimes they understand and they're like, I know this is hard for you, but sometimes I've heard teachers will say to them, you had math, why are you struggling with this? All this is is ratios and proportions. But that doesn't look like ratios and proportions. And students aren't used to seeing that. And so that's, you know, that's what a lot of these pathways courses we've done. We try to get things like this into them where students can start to work with context, real context, and use their math, not just learn how to set up a proportion, because they've been doing that since seventh grade. It's use it in the kinds of ways that are going to be expected to. And so we're aiming for content. This is what's really key. We don't want content that's too juvenile. You're working with 17-year-olds, and in our case, you know, that probably don't want to be in this class. 
So we've got to have things that are relevant to them that don't feel like we're talking down to them. So not only do we not want contrivance, but we don't want things that are too babyish to them either. Um, if your state is a common core state like mine is, this does align and continue common core. But one of the reasons I was just mentioning that whole issue juvenile and that, that problem is sometimes um, teachers will be like, oh, okay, we have lots of common core resources. And sometimes they work for transitional math, but sometimes they don't because they might be directed towards a 14 year old um, or they're not really realistic. Um, but that's, this is the kind of thing that a student is gonna work on in a transitional course. This is what, and those of you that have seen me speak about pathways forever, I showed this slide forever and it still applies here. This is what we want, that a student can use the math they have. So that's the emphasis in these courses. It's not about just gaining 40 new skills. It's constantly in these transitional courses, it's about can you use it? Can you apply it? Can you retain it? Can you make use of it? Because we all know this, that when they come into a college algebra class, Okay, in theory, they've had algebra two or intermediate algebra, but as soon as you start working on rational expressions and they have to find a common denominator and you're like, okay, we have to get to factor. And they're like, what is this factoring you speak of? You know, they don't even know what we're talking about. They don't retain it. And so that's what an issue too is that we see um, sometimes with the high schools. Um, and the high school teachers mention this too. They know this, the students aren't always retaining and connecting concepts. So that is, the premise of these courses is based in problem solving and a, a high cognitive load. I mean, it's not going to be parsed out into just skills. Everything is, we start with problems and we get skills as we need to, to be able to solve problems. So that when they get to a college class, that's what they're ready to do. Okay, a few of the highlights of this, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. We have competencies. The main thing with competencies, as opposed to having a standard or an objective or, or an outcome, the idea is competency, as we are defining it, means it's about what a student can do in an authentic context. So it's about how they can integrate and apply skills. I didn't come up with that, but when I saw that in the law, and I saw it, I was like, ooh, I like that. That aligns with everything that's in my worldview of what we should be doing with students in mathematics. Um, so that's why I was so drawn to this project, because I was reading the law and I was like, Wow, there's a lot good here that aligns with many initiatives that are already in place. Um, we also have key performance indicators, which are like a drill down from the competency and the document. Uh, here's the link, and it'll also be at the end of the slides. And when you get the slides, um, you can go see this. Um, but the key performance indicators are a little bit more specific. The competency is broader. What we're aiming for is the competency level, but not just that you have all these these skills but that they can integrate them and we want to go higher and do this taxonomy whenever possible. Okay, what are the benefits? You're going to serve underrepresented groups more. You're going to increase equity and access, especially in our state because we are not doing this based off of that the schools have to have their own grant to afford textbooks or they have to even be able to afford a textbook. Um, so even poorer districts can do this. We're basing all any materials that we provide schools if they want to use it, they can use whatever they want, but if they, if they choose whatever the state is putting together as samples, that they're free. That's a big thing. Um, for schools that are interested in improving their SS score, has a college and career readiness category, this will help them. You're gonna have fewer students in dev ed, more students in college math, and this should increase completion rates and college enrollments, especially because you can have students that sometimes when you start college, as soon as they see they're gonna be in two years of dev ed. Um, is that all going to happen instantaneously? No, but for those schools that have done this for years, these are the trends that they have seen. That's and this is the biggie. We would love everybody to play well in the sandbox. So we're trying to build relationships between K-12 and college. That is not easily done because there's a lot of mistrust in both directions. Um, and maybe that's just my state, but I've seen that in many places. Um, so, you know, yeah. You have to have a lot of hard conversations, and I mediate a lot. I'll put it that way. That's one of the big things I do. This visual should help, I think, make sense of what we're trying to do that's different. This is not dual credit. This is not the college hands down the book, the course, and says, go, like you do in dual credit, which makes sense in dual credit because it's the college course that their college is going to give credit for. But this is not that. This is the college is just giving the student placement. They're basically opening the door. That's it. They're not giving them credit for anything. So this is on a level playing field that the high school and the colleges develop these courses and um, grading requirements, all of it together. That is not easily done. 
especially because most people, if they have any reference point of working with a high school, if they're at a college, their reference point is dual credit. So it's, you know, it's something that you constantly have to work on. But the goal is communication and trust. It's not easily, does not easily happen, but, you know, it's true. That's what it takes to make it work. Someone sent this to me, and I just love this so much. Um, it, we cannot play the blame game. I always emphasize that when I work with any groups. We are not going to play the blame game, and people love to do that. I had um, a faculty member at one event stand up and said, well, if high schools were just doing our job, doing their job, we wouldn't be here. I'm like, well, that's not helpful, and that's also not always true. Um, sometimes they are doing their job, and there's things that, are, you know, a student takes a year off, and, you know, things happen. You know, they do lose that readiness that they had. Um, so I love this and, um, I, you know, I'm just, whoever came up with this, I know I'm not trying to steal their credit. I think they did a fantastic job with their, this cartoon. Um, you can always blame the level below you and keep in mind everything that we say about high schools, universities say about community colleges. So, I mean, I, that's why I try to remind faculty too, um, when you're thinking, you know, these things, well, the high schools do this and the high schools do this. Just keep in mind the average university faculty member does not think college community college teach the same level of course that they do. They don't think our calculus is the same, our statistics. So I mean, that idea of the level below us, they're not quite doing what we're doing, is pervasive. Um, what does it take to make these a success? So I just wanna hit a, a few, few highlights of this. One big thing that we work on is having a memo of understanding, an MOU that everybody agrees on. So it's like getting down paper, what is each side going to do? How is the grade gonna be figured? How is the placement going to work? You've got to have training support. Advising is core to everything that you do in reform. Um, we have to evaluate and prove things over time, and the relationships matter. And one thing I've seen that's been a struggle is sometimes you have a faculty who has trouble working with administrators of different levels, meaning like um, a high school math teacher working with an administrator at a community college. It's basically like they're not used to working together. They're like, I work with community college faculty, I work with high school administrators, and like having to work across levels is a challenge sometimes, but it can be done. All right, um, I, wanna, I don't want to take much more of your time, so I want to wrap this up, although I'm not seeing questions, so I'm going to try to hit a few more things. One of the things I do, and this is something you can take away if you want to do this, even just locally, I offer summits. What a summit is, it's three hours, and I ask the high school to bring a team of a administrator, a math teacher, and a counselor. Each high school brings their team, and then the community college brings their team. And those are minimums. More are welcome. And what we do is I take about an hour or so to get everybody acquainted with how transitional math is working in our state. Then they have an hour where I have a worksheet for them, and the high schools work in their own teams. I circle around. The college works in its team, and I try to answer any local questions. And then the third hour is about MOU discussion. And that can be interesting. I'll be the first to admit. But that's where you start trying to get down to brass tacks, devils in the details. Um, when we're talking about how is a grade going to be figured, how is this actually going to work, that's where that MOU discussion starts. And then it continues after that. It doesn't all get done in a day. I've done 13 of these. I started last October, I think I started. And I did 13 between October and May. And I got 13 starting, and they're like almost all between September and October. So I just, I get a lot of miles. I'm running all over Illinois. Um, I want you to see our grading requirements. Um, for This is something we came up with as part of our state policies. At least 25% of the grade must come from problem or project-based tasks, and that is to ensure the, uh, that applied component is being factored into this course. It's not just another algebra course. Um, Yes, there is homework and part of the grade, but it's capped in how much it can be, and no single test can be worth more than half the grade, which stops a, high, a college from saying, okay, yeah, we'll go, we'll give you placement by your grade, but it's just one grade and it's your final exam, in effect, making the placement exam. So that stops that. So basically, it's checks and balances on both sides, and we come up with something that makes sense and is reasonable for both levels. I'll skip past uh, the rest of that. Um, I'm going to skip that too as well. Okay, the last thing I want to hit before we close it up is this is our, how we are ensuring quality in Illinois. And this is an idea that you might want to be interested in, or you might not. It, it depends on your perspective. In Illinois, we've had forever this thing called IAI, Illinois Articulation Initiative. And it's this group, and they have a panel, and we have them for all different kinds of things, like Gen Ed Math has one, uh, Math Majors has one, 
But what they do is a panel made of community college and university faculty that meet with state agency personnel maybe twice a year and they look at courses that are submitted. If they meet the requirements, there is granted transfer. And that transfer works with any college or university throughout the state. So students, they love this because they can take their placement throughout, or not their placement, their credit throughout the state. We're emulating that with this process. We have a portability panel. So it's made up of high school or community college faculty and a few from university level. And they will be looking at some kind of documentation. We're figuring out the details of that. And if they, they um, determine that the course has met the policies and competencies that are supposed to happen, then that course is stamped portable. And any student that passes it with a senior better at the high school gets a code on their high school transcript that when the college sees that code, that means they have to give them a certain placement. So they have to let them in a certain placement. Um, this is the idea of trying to build collegiality and trust and have everybody at the table and really including faculty but it is not simple. I will be the first to admit that, but it does let faculty have ownership over the process. All right, um, I only had a few more, but I'm not gonna hit them. I'm just like, is there any other questions? Um, yes, we're gonna do professional development. We're, gonna, we're building curriculum resources. We will have a new website in the near future. The website, if you go to now, is pretty bare bones. We're gonna have a new one with a lot of things that we've been working on. So if you're interested in seeing that, check back in about another month and a half. Um, to the current website and it should forward you to the new one. And um, so we're working on all kinds of things, professional development, everything under the sun. So I'm gonna click past this. Um, I wanted you to see where we're at with scale. We're estimating about 40% of our high schools are gonna be doing this in fall 19, but this, the law says we have to get to 100%, either do it or opt out. So we're gonna have a lot. Okay, so I saw some questions. Um, what do you believe explains why trans or, or did, Julie, did you want to take them? Yeah, that's okay. There is that one question that came in. It says, what do you believe explains why transitional programs work better than standard algebra-based programs? Is it simply the emphasis on career context? If we simplified all the initiatives out there to one thing, would it be giving people something besides algebra? Yes, and I think it's, it's what it's doing is that these programs are based on the same philosophy that Pathways courses are based on, which is not just teaching skills separately, but trying to integrate them as much as possible by asking students to solve bigger problems. Um, context research shows is effective with students and it's motivating and it helps them make sense of things. And that's what these courses are taking advantage of. Um, and so that's why we've already seen some success and I know we'll see more. You had one more, and it was, if statewide initiatives are not present, like in Illinois, what are some ways that schools can or have addressed the portability of the courses? Oh, that's awesome. What you can do is, and I've seen some schools do this, if there's a particular school that you know that a lot of times students from your school will go to because they have a particular program or whatever, you can set up a local portability agreement that between maybe your chief academic officers, they talk about this and they agree to accept each other's transitional placement. So you can make basically cobble it together with any um, colleges or universities that you work with regularly. Um, and the main thing is to have a discussion and to let them see what you're doing and why it's worth having that, um, that placement. Yeah, it is 12.59 my time, so we only have one right. minute. If I could switch over, I can keep you on the line. I know there's, there are some more questions if you wouldn't mind staying, but I wanted to make sure that people could do the survey and, and wrap up before um, they have to go. <laughs> All righty. Okay, let's see. Um, I'll stay on, but yes, you can go and do that. Okay, perfect. Let's see, how come I'm not seeing it? There we go. Thank you so much for participating in today's um, webinar. If you'd like to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC. You can go to bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. We are on Facebook. You're, we've got regional Facebook groups as well. We are also on um, Twitter if you want to check us out. Recordings of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC dash webinars. It usually takes us about a week or two to produ produce and upload uh, webinars to archive. I will make sure that you all get an email when this one is um, posted online. So before you leave, if you could take two minutes to evaluate the webinar and the content, um, please do so. You can go to bit.ly 
bit.ly slash amatic73. You can use the QR code on the screen or I just put the link in the chat for you. I am gonna go ahead and stop the recording. We'll keep Kathy on the line to make sure that we answer these last few questions. Thank you all so much for attending today.